And if you see in this topic, you could, you may leave now. But all of you, I hope, all of you are very much interested in this topic. So I assume that everybody is so eager to get some ideas, some information on this topic. Now before I start, I have to introduce each one of these uh, uh, panels and uh, presenters. First of all, my name is Yun Won Wang, Vice President of Chungwan University, majoring in Public Administration. And I'm honored, uh, for the first time in my family history, I'm here in front. So, uh, you know how, how proud I am myself. <clears throat> anyway, and uh, let me introduce uh, the lady first, this cousin, mm -hmm. Professor Mark Quasar from Indian University. What, please, what? <laughs> and, uh, Professor uh, Manolo Abella. Uh, yes. He will be presenting the paper on the topic of the globalization of the market for health professionals. Uh, he is now Chief Technical Advisor, Governance of Labor Migration, Hong Kong, Thailand. And he has uh, studied in America, I guess, but he's master's degree from Harvard University. As everyone knows, Harvard University is best known in Korea, not in America. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, the gentleman with the uh, red tie in the middle, Stephen Hassel. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, Philip Martin. Managing Labor Migration, a Comparative View. And uh, he is an expert in this field, as you can see in his syllabus. And also the last one, Stephen Castle. Uh, he will be presenting. Yes. <laughs> he will be presenting uh, the paper, Will Labor Migration Lead to a Multicultural Society? Tremendous research in this field. From, uh, he will be presenting uh, this paper with very strong uh, British accent, I guess. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's start first uh, with the. We will be first, right? Uh, Professor Wang, and thank all of you for being here to talk about managing migration in a bit of comparative uh, perspective. Uh, we're going to talk about moving um, people across borders, and the first thing we have to do is move the slides, um, which is not moving. Um, and so, therefore, I have to figure out. Does anyone know? It says next, but it's not. Uh, it's not moving to the next slide. Um, is there another trick to this to make it work? Okay. Ah. Can I get you to just move to the next slide? Since the oh, there we go. We're going to talk about moving workers from the top and bottom of pyramid-shaped societies and. We're going to talk about the impact of moving workers over borders uh, on both the countries that receive migrants as well as the countries that send migrants. Um, we, the, the policy of most of the industrial countries is to welcome skilled workers and rotate on skilled workers. So roughly what that means is most countries want to welcome those who have at least a college degree and allow many of them to settle, but try to rotate in and out workers that have less than a secondary school education. Start with the basics. We have about 6.6 .6 billion people in the world, 
and about half of them are in the labor force. And that's true for most countries of the world, imagine 50%. If we take the population of a country and divide by two, that's roughly the labor force. In the 30 industrial countries that include Korea and Japan and Western Europe and Canada and the United States, we have roughly one-sixth of the world's population, one-sixth of the world's workers. And in the 165 developing countries, we have the other five-sixths of the world's population and workers. And the demographic growth, as we heard this morning, is almost all in the developing countries. There are four flows of migrants. And the largest flow is that movement from developing countries to industrial countries. About 62 million migrants have moved from a developing to an industrial country. But it's important to keep in mind that the second biggest flow is from one developing country to another, as from Indonesia to Malaysia, or from Burma uh, to Thailand. There's also a lot of migration from one industrial country to another, as from uh, Canada to the United States, or from uh, within Western Europe. And there's a smaller flow from industrial to developing countries. We know that most people are in the developing countries. And we also, and that's a demographic inequality that promotes migration, there's also an economic inequality that promotes the movement from developing to industrial countries. If we look in 2005, the average income in those 30 rich countries was a little over 35,000 U.S. dollars. And in the 165 poorer countries, it was about 5% as much. So an average person moving across borders from a developing to an industrial country would increase his or her income by 20 times. We know that there has been lots of economic growth in China and India and other developing countries, but that gap between countries has not narrowed a lot in the last 25 years. It's also true that we've had revolutions in communications. It's easier to learn about opportunities abroad and revolutions in transportation. It's much faster to repay the cost of getting to another country today than it was in the past. Now, people don't just strike out blindly when they cross borders to look for jobs. They generally know roughly where they're going to wind up being employed. And in the industrial countries, there are four major sectors that employ migrant workers. One is agriculture, another is construction. It's not all manufacturing, but usually small and medium enterprises, especially in supplying parts to larger enterprises, and then selected services. Services both at the high end of the job ladder, like in IT and computer programming, and at the low end, as in restaurants or cleaning services. In a country like the United States, a country of immigration, a country that has about 20% of the world's migrants, it's important to keep in mind that only about one in seven workers is a migrant, that is somebody born in another country, and the labor force is huge. Therefore, most U.S. workers and most U.S. employers never hire or work with a migrant worker. If one is looking at how to manage the migration between developing and industrial countries that's motivated by demographic and economic inequalities, facilitated by ease of communication and transportation, the political leaders know that it's very hard to reduce those differences quickly. They don't want to slow down communications and transportation that make it easier to cross borders. Their employers typically want to hire migrants. And so the default option, the default instrument for managing migration, has been to try to adjust the rights of migrants in, a, in an effort 
to better manage the inflow and settlement of people. In the United States, the slogan was that as a country of immigration, the United States welcomed people who want a hand up the job life, but not a hand out for welfare assistance. And therefore, the decision was made about a decade ago to not take steps to reduce illegal and legal migration, but to make it very difficult to get social assistance. In Europe in the early 1990s, the decision was made in countries like Germany not to change the fundamental right to asylum, but to make it much harder to apply for asylum in the first place. We know who moves. Young people tend to move, and it's important to remember that the best predictor of income in industrial countries is years of schooling. It's very true that Bill Gates did not finish college, but on average, more years of education tends to lead to higher income. In a developing country, the labor force has a pyramid shape. A few well-educated people at the top, many who have not finished secondary school at the bottom. And in the industrial countries to which migrants move have more of a diamond shape labor force. That is, more people who are college educated, fewer who are not secondary school leavers, and a broad middle. Migration moves people from the top and the bottom of a pyramid, that is the well-educated and the not well-educated, and takes them to the top and the bottom of a diamond. Now, in theory, moving people over borders should produce winners. And the World Bank and other organizations talk about win-win-win migration. The migrants have higher incomes. The employers get jobs filled. The sending countries get remittances. The receiving countries can get larger economies. There can also be losers. It's been very difficult to measure the losses from international labor migration. We can skip through how we measure it, but in an economy like the United States, the net economic benefits from migration, from the migration of, remember, one-seventh of the labor force, it was estimated to be about two weeks normal economic growth. So the net, remember, the biggest beneficiaries of migrants are the migrants. But the net benefit was, was positive and fairly significant, but in a big economy, uh, relatively small. So if most industrial countries, including Korea, don't necessarily want immigrants, but they do want migrant labor, how do they get them? Well, many countries have guest worker programs. All industrial countries have guest worker programs. And the goal there is simple. How do we add workers temporarily to the labor force, but not settlers to the population? The experience is everywhere the same. There's nothing more permanent than temporary workers. All programs tend to get bigger and to last longer than people thought. There are several reasons. One is that in the sending countries, sending workers abroad does not necessarily produce economic development. It can, but it doesn't necessarily do. The reality is that sometimes the best and brightest leave, the remittances that go back might benefit families, but not lead to development. And in many cases, return migrants rest rather than become entrepreneurs. There are two extremes. One extreme is a country like India that sent computer programmers abroad and got a whole new outsourcing industry that employs not a huge part of the big Indian labor force, but some part, and will make the migration of children of some migrants unnecessary. In Africa, by contrast, there's a lot of emigration of healthcare professionals in countries that have many health issues, uh, and that may wind up increasing future migration. There's a lot of in-between cases, and we'll hear about some of those uh, in, from some of the other speakers. There is a push for more migration. We have it from the World Bank. We have it in the gas mode for negotiations. We have it in ongoing UN uh, discussions. What, 
One of the fundamental issues in international labor migration is that it's differences that motivate migration. But international standards say that once people are over borders in receiving countries, they should be treated equally. Now, clearly, if you treat people totally equally, that means the same wages and benefits, they could wind up being more expensive. If they are more expensive, that could mean fewer of them will be employed. The re countries receiving migrants are working with rules by which they try to select people to settle, often those highly skilled, and rotate unskilled workers through their year-round jobs. That's often a very difficult thing to do. Uh, the selection systems we won't deal much with. Uh, this is their, in, in picking newcomers, do you pick people based on their human capital, or do you pick them based on what the employer says that a particular worker is best to fill a job? On the guest worker issue, which is the one that is perhaps most applicable uh, to Korea, the difficulty is to keep the programs from getting bigger and lasting longer. The reasons are really easy to understand. If you tell a worker you have to leave after three years, that worker is young and flexible, and he or she might say, why should I go back to lower wages at home? Because I've learned some language, I am now getting high wages. The employer says, I've trained that person, why send him or her back after three years? and therefore take a chance on a new money. So the tendency is for employers to try to prolong the stay and for the migrants to try to prolong their stay. And the combination of those two things is what tends to make the programs get larger and last longer. Without, if, we, if countries don't deal with those, they're likely to suffer the same fate with 21st century guest worker programs that we had in the 20th century. So in the 21st century, what would make them work? Well, one are economic mechanisms that align the incentives of employers and migrants with the program rules. There are a whole lot of other economic incentives that can be built into programs in order to get migrants and employers to voluntarily obey the rules as opposed to assuming that they will obey the rules because if they don't, they will suffer economic penalties. The main thing that all countries do is they usually announce a package in which they take steps to reduce illegal or unauthorized migration, and at the same time, they have some system for legalizing some of the people already there. It's a package that's repeated over and over again, there has to be a lot more thinking about how to make those packages work. If we think about how much research we have on tax laws, how to collect taxes from people, there's far more effort at figuring out how to make tax systems efficient than how to make migration systems efficient. Let me just close with some advice on how to think about migration. Uh, migration is a process that industrial countries are learning to manage. It's not a problem that's going to be solved. If, if governments look at migration as a problem that they're going to pass a law and solve, it won't work. So for young people looking for a career, managing migration will be a growth industry. It's not a shrinking industry. The second thing to re I think it's worth remembering is migration poses many difficult trade-offs. Not between a bad and a good. As we teach our students in economics, if you have a choice between a bad and a good, choose the good. What's more difficult is if you have two goods, which gets higher priority. The numbers versus rights issue is a, something that is inherent in thinking about labor migration uh, issues. And finally, is the idea that there are no easy solutions. The little phrase is one that those of us at universities know that one of the hardest things to do is to manage parking. Everyone wants to park right near where they study or have an office. 
And at the end of long discussions on how to find enough parking for our faculty and students, and the, the, the aphorism is always, anyone who has a solution does not understand the problem. Anyone who understands the problem does not have a solution. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Martin. Professor Mar uh, Philip Martin uh, gave us the whole picture of migration. I think uh, the topics of our, uh, our discussion today is globalization, uh, foreign workers, and homogeneous, homogeneous countries like Korea. Now, glo the word globalization means uh, no borders, first of all, and no foreign countries. There's only one country, globalization means. Growth is becoming one country, I guess. So now we're talking about very paradoxical issues here. Now we're talking about globalization or global market versus foreign or domestic, or homogeneous or heterogeneous. So I think it's, it's, there is no right answer or, or good answer or bad answer, definitely. So we will just, you know, opening can of war, I guess. So we will see what's going to happen. To, uh, to the gentleman from uh, uh, Thailand, uh, Manolo Abella, he will be, again, he will be discussing on the globalization of the market for specific areas of health professionals. Would you please welcome him? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me start by thanking the organizers of the Global Human Resource Forum for this uh, opportunity and this privilege uh, to address uh, so many distinguished scholars, professionals in the human resource field. Uh, my topic is um, the globalization of the market for health professionals. Uh, I start by raising the question whether it makes sense to speak of globalization and migration in the same breath, because at the global level we know that the growth of migration compared to the movement of capital and trade has been unimpressive. Migrants as a percentage of the world's population has remained less than 3% over three decades. Hence, why should we relate these two phenomena? This uh, global figure, however, ma masks large differences among regions and categories of migrants. There has been a very rapid growth of migration to the rich countries, and in some regions like Asia, the movements of workers across borders have taken on in very important dimensions, both in numbers and in terms of returns in the form of remittances. In the Club of Rich Countries, the OECD, there are today an estimated one out of every eight workers is now foreign born. And in the case of gross border movements of workers, the most significant feature is the rapid growth at the low and high end of this uh, skill spectrum, reflecting perhaps the profound economic and social changes which shape labor market conditions in the more developed countries. My concern in this presentation is with the rapid growth of migration, not at the low end of the scale, which is very large, but more specifically at the high end of the skill spectrum, namely the movement of health professionals and workers. I'm referring to doctors, nurses, and other health caregivers and allied professionals. The movements of these workers has recently been receiving a lot of attention because of concerns about their impact on health conditions in the origin countries. Some already speak of a crisis in the global supply of health workers. In this presentation, I address the question, what is, the driving, what is driving the demand uh, and thus the migration of this group of workers? and are the forces driving them likely to strengthen or weaken in the next few decades? 
this globalization then leading to another adverse consequence of redistributing scarce skills against the interests of the poor countries. The key points I would like to make are only three. First of all, that there's a high demand in rich countries which is creating a global market for health workers. Secondly, that the competition for health workers will lead to more permanent migration and even in homogeneous societies. And finally, that there are winners and losers. We need to cooperate among each other in order to compensate those who lose in the process. What is driving the growth of demand for health workers? Clearly, it is demographic and economic. The growing demand is created by increased spending on health in the economically advanced countries. Why are they spending? Well, because people are living longer, much longer, and more of them are voting. In fact, they constitute a large majority of the voting population, are uh, voting for more money to be spent for their health care. Because of the scarcity of supply, borders are increasingly being opened for the permanent admission and even the settlement of health workers. In countries short of such skills, they are becoming the spearheads of the growing, the growing global mobile workers, many members of whom, particularly those who do not have the skills, are much less welcome, especially, especially in ethnically more homogeneous societies. This has led to a situation where a global market now exists for health workers, allowing them to cross national borders for employment in spite of a lot of obstacles posed not only by immigration restrictions of the past, but also because of strict requirements and the practice of most medical professions. The emigration of highly skilled uh, of the health workers uh, is unfortunately leading to adverse outcomes on health in the origin countries. So it raises the question whether should rich countries then, in the spirit of altruism, try to restrain or restrict the immigration of such people. To, in my mind, to restrict their movement is unfortunately going to lead to worse consequences. As you all know, wage differentials exert powerful incentives, and those are difference, differences between, are very large between the less developed countries and the rich countries. My worry is that there will be less investments in education to acquire the skills needed, especially in countries that have shown a comparative advantage in educating health workers. This graph shows you uh, the large numbers of doctors and nurses uh, from the non-OECD countries that are already working in the OECD countries. Of the foreign doctors, Asia uh, comprise the biggest origin region, and here Asia does not include the OECD members, Japan and Korea. And they're supplying already about 162,000 doctors and about 190,000 nurses to the OECD countries. Latin America is the next biggest source. The OECD health data for 2007 shows that the number of doctors in the OECD countries has increased by 35% over the past 15 years to 2.8 million. In 1970, countries like Denmark, Finland, France, or Portugal, which hardly had any foreign trained doctors. Today, 11% of Denmark, 7% of Finland, 6% of France, and 5.3% of Portugal's doctors are foreign trained. One in every three doctors practicing in the UK are foreign trained, and one in four in the US, uh, and it is closely followed by Australia. The growth of these medical professionals in the OECD countries accelerated between 2000 and 2005. Caring for the elderly is becoming a complex challenge for advanced countries. We are discovering new illnesses and diseases which are not known before when, our, when people died much younger. As you all know now we have 
many more cancers uh, and disease. We have Alzheimer's and so on. These are caring for elderly cannot be, unfortunately, cannot be automated or mechanized. There are functions, these are functions which used to be performed by families, by the younger members of the families, especially very large ones. But what happens when families become smaller, much smaller? In one child families, a typical young married couple will now have to take care of the parents of both the husband and the wife. In this graph, I show you the data uh, from the European Commission on how uh, for the large EU, that is 25 member states, it depicts in dramatic fashion how annual rate of growth of the working population has turned negative during the current decade and will steadily decline until 2030. On the other hand, the rate of growth of the population 65 years and over are expected to climb up between now and 2010 and remain at high level till about 2030. Today, 12% of Korea's population are 65 years and old. By 2025, or only 17 years from now, Korea will have nearly 28% of its population in this elderly age group. That is 6 million more old people to take care of. Over less than half a century, between 1960 and 2005, the average Korean can expect to live longer by as much as 25.3 years. That is an amazing achievement in prolonging life expectancy. In Japan, the aging of the population is faster than that projected for Italy, Europe's fastest aging society. The impact of longevity is more clearly demonstrated in this graph for Korea. Today, only 3% of the population are over 75 years of age. That is usually the age when people will be acquiring, requiring a lot of care and medical services. By 2020, the percentage will be more than double. And by 2050, such old people will account for over 21% of Korea's population. What will be the implications of an aging population? The support ra ratio is expected to drop very considerably uh, between today and 2050. By 2050, there will be 1.4 person per every old person in Korea. The demand for medical health care, uh, there are there's a large, still a large supply of nurses and doctors in Korea, but there's also very high rate of withdrawal from the workforce. I understand that for today's 192,000 registered nurses in Korea, only 40% remain active. And also, you must remember that nurses get older and discouraged by long working hours. The U.S. Uh, has a younger population, thanks to large immigration, but as this graph shows, the country's 65-year-old uh, and over population will grow from about 35 million today to about 55 million in another 10 years. By 2050, they will number about 80 million. Moreover, the proportion of those 85 years and over will rise significantly. What will this demographic trends mean? For one, there will be a reduction of the workforce. And that will be true even if the participation rates were to rise partly to mitigate the decline. Societies also need a large variety of skills, especially modern societies. And it will be harder and harder to find those skills in an aging society. Households and governments will be spending more for the early elderly, and unfortunately many of the elderly are still without social security. We will be witnessing very severe change in family structures. A need for taking care of the elderly will require changes in our institutions for financing health care, the institutional arrangements for the direct services, 
technologies and bio te biological sciences will have to be adapted to the requirements and of course the services, nursing care and health care for the aged, uh, very labor inter intensive occupations uh, will be very much uh, an issue. Uh, this graph shows you the, the amount of spending uh, for healthcare in the rich countries, and on the average, it's risen from about 6.9 to 9 percent of the gross domestic product of these countries. In the U.S., the percentage even reached up to a high of 15 percent. We understand that Korea has the lowest, with 6 percent, uh, which is about up from 4 percent 15 years ago. Per capita, health spending has increased by more than 80 percent in real terms between 1990 and 2005, on the average, in the OECD countries, outpacing the 37 percent growth in the per capita gross domestic product. In Korea, I understand that you are now spending something in the range of 38 billion U.S. dollars a year on health expenditures. The problem is that the numbers of people taking care of all people are not likely to rise. And in fact, in the U.S., there is a great deal of worry that the, the supply uh, uh, will go down when the demand is increasing. As this chart shows, U.S. authorities already see a widening gap between the demand and supply of nurses in the U.S. In 2000, there were almost 1.9 million registered nurses well, the estimated demand was 2 million. By 2020, the shortage, unless remedied, is expected to climb up to 29%. The reason for the lack of supply is largely economic. The, in the U.S., the earnings of nurses have remained flat over two decades, and today nurses earn almost $14,000 less than elementary school teachers compared to 1983. And of course, there is the aging of the nursing population. What will this mean for the global demand and supply of health workers? The, w, the, the, the World Health Organization estimated that there will be a serious, that there is already a serious crisis in health care. There are, the health workforce globally is about 59 million. But this is very unevenly distributed. In the African countries, it's only an average of 2.3 per thousand, while in the Americas, there will be 25 health workers per thousand. The WHO predicts a shortage of about 2.4 million health service providers across the world. And of the 57 countries that have a critical shortage, 36 are sub-Saharan African countries. Note here that the shortage does not mean an excess uh, of demand over supply. Uh, what, the, what, what is the problem here is that these shortages are based mainly on ratios, desirable ratios, between health workers and patients. The problem is severe because the countries that require a lot of workers because of the conditions in these countries, and mainly developing countries, do not have the resources to pay for those people whom they need to work. Those, uh, that can be demonstrated so clearly that in rich countries, they spend about $2,700 per capita on health versus less than $90, for example, in a country like India, or $270 a year for China. It's clear that migration uh, will not address the problem. Even if all African-born doctors and nurses working in the OECD countries were to go home, they will represent no more than 12% of the total estimated shortage in that region. There are clearly uh, moves in all the rich countries because of increasing competition for these people, for these health workers, to liberalize the movement, uh, remove all obstacles, fast-track the admission of people, and offer them more permanent stay. 
So if markets are allowed to work, the powerful magnets of large salary differentials between rich countries and the less developed countries will no doubt lead to greater flows from south to north. Will the globalization of market for health professionals lead to very great setbacks for the health outcomes? I end here by just saying four conditions that we probably will need to consider. Clearly, we need to have cooperation based on principles of fairness and equity. And we need to invest much more heavily, perhaps through development aid, in improving health outcomes in many countries. But health outcomes do not depend only on the number of health workers. They very importantly depend on investment in hospitals, adequate supplies, and infrastructure. There is a need for leadership, the proper leadership in developing countries, so that health expenditures will be given priority in budgetary allocations. And thirdly, we must consider that some countries may have a comparative advantage in producing health workers. Is it not possible to envisage that a country like China, which will now have 150,000 more people enrolled in nursing, will be able to provide much more of the health care people in other parts of the world, particularly in Africa? And finally, migration policy. Liberalizing migration will be important but it will be equally important in developing countries where probably the need for attracting more health workers in the short term will be important. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abella. Uh, labor uh, migration uh, in the field of the health professionals. Uh, Mr. Abella is working as uh, the uh, technical advisor in uh, ILO, so he, I think he has um, he has uh, researched it uh, uh, with all his uh, uh, all his experiences in this field. Uh, we have uh, we have seen how do we manage, if possible, how do we manage the labor migration by Professor Martin, and now we we've, we've seen uh, uh, Mr. Avella's. Uh, kind of case research in the uh, health professionals. Now when he was uh, uh, presenting paper, I was all of a sudden, I was thinking of, uh, of uh, Korean experience in 1960s. Uh, as everybody knows uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, the Korean audiences, of course, uh, in 1960s we have sent many medical doctors and nurses to America. And if you visit any, uh, any cities in America, you can see many Korean medical doctors, of course nurses included. Uh, most of them, they have been exported in 1960s and they, they have been uh, uh, practiced uh, well enough and accepted in that society, uh, which is, of course, America is a uh, multicultural society. But I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, of uh, American medical doctor come to Korea or Filipino uh, nurses come to Korea. And is it possible in Korean society for Koreans to accept those people just like we've been treated in America? So we have to think about a lot of things, cultural things of course. Uh, it, this is homogeneous society like Korea. Uh, as Philip Martin said, we have uh, many issues and many issues has been discussed and uh, uh, research, I guess. So now, after these two topics, now we will come back to the real issue. Korea case. Uh, Professor Stephen Castle, uh, even though he is not living in Korea, and he is not Korean, of course, and with his professional eyes, he will examine uh, will labor migration lead a multi multicultural society in Korea. Now, he will give us brilliant view in the Korean case. Would you please welcome uh, Professor Stephen Kessel. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I would also like to thank the organizers for allowing me to come to this very interesting forum. Uh, and of course, as our chairman said, I am not Korean and I don't know Korea, so of course it's impossible for me to tell you what is going to happen in your society. 
but what I can do is try and give a little bit of international comparison and try and draw some possible conclusions of what that might mean for Korea. Um, and I believe that Korea no longer has to decide whether it will become a multicultural society. I think it made that decision years ago, and maybe unconsciously, when it decided to participate fully in the emerging global economy. And I think Korea confirmed that decision of a move towards multiculturalism when it decided to actively recruit foreign migrant workers, both skilled and low skilled. So I think the decision for Korea today is not really on what, whether it wants to be a multicultural society, but what type of multicultural society it wants to be. Does it want to be an exclusionary society in which immigrants and minorities are treated as second class citizens? Or does it want to be an inclusive society in which everybody who contributes to the economy and the society enjoys equal treatment and equal opportunities. So this is what I want to do today in the very short time we have available. I want to talk about some of the important terms in this field. I want to talk about why labor migration leads to ethnic diversity. I want to talk a little bit about some of the European experiences in this field and then perhaps draw some conclusions for Korea and talk about how a multicultural policy could look in Korea. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I have provided the organizers of the forum with quite a detailed written paper. Unfortunately, it was too late to get into the book which you all received, but I won't have time to go into a great deal of detail about these definitions now, so I would ask those of you who are interested to get hold of that paper, or perhaps I can send it to you even, where you will find these definitions much more precise. But let me just talk about them briefly. A multicultural society is simply a society made up, up of groups that are diverse on the basis of cultural characteristics, such as language, religion, customs and values. And I think it's important to realize that diversity is not just because of immigration. In modern liberal societies, people have diverse cultural values and diverse ways of life, even if they belong to the majority group. Ethnicity is defined as a sense of group belonging based on ideas of common origins, history, language, experience, and values. Um, and of course, those of you who study this will know there is something like 6,000 ethnic groups in the world, but there are only about 200 nation states. So the overwhelming majority of nation states are made up of multiple ethnic groups. Um, an ethnic minority is a group that is distinguished from the majority population on the basis of ethnicity. And this can lead to discrimination or social exclusion. We don't really speak of a minority unless there is some sort of a problem of exclusion. A multi-ethnic society is a society made up of two or more ethnic groups, and that applies to the great majority of countries in the world today. So the idea of being a homogenous society, which I know is very widespread in Korea, is quite unusual in international terms. Now what does this mean for multiculturalism? Most of the world's societies are multicultural, but that doesn't mean that they have policies of multiculturalism. An example of a multicultural society could have been South Africa under the apartheid regime. It had many groups, but there was no idea of a state policy to achieve equality. It, was not, it didn't have a policy of multiculturalism. So the key idea of multiculturalism it is that it is the responsibility of the state to ensure good intergroup relations. And that has two elements. One is the recognition of the rights of ethnic groups to maintain their own cultures, in other words, to speak their own languages, have different religions and customs. And the second element is that there is action by the state to guarantee equality of opportunities by preventing discrimination or racism against members of minority groups. And secondly, ensuring that every member of society can participate fully 
in education, the economy, and politics. So it's important to see those two elements, recognition and action for equality, as part of multiculturalism. Now, to go back to the Korean case, the decision has been taken in recent years to set up an employment permit system to bring in temporary migrant workers. Now, is it possible to have temporary migrant workers without settlement? I don't really need to discuss this because Phil Martin has already told us the answer, that there is nothing so permanent as temporary workers. Um, but I think we can go beyond the aspect of the workers themselves and look what it means to become part of global economy and global society. If you have flows of capital and commodities, you also have flows of ideas and people. And you cannot have a successful open society without having those flows. The development of technology, technology transfer, is indeed linked to cultural diversity, as we heard from many of the uh, CEOs this morning. And it's a two-way process. One reason why Korea has had a remarkable economic takeoff is because Koreans themselves have gone and worked and studied in other countries. That inevitably has not only technological effects in Korea, but also cultural effects. So migration is not a one-way street. It's a multi-directional process with its own social dynamics. Um, now, I was going to talk a bit about European examples, but we are very short of time. So let me just say very briefly that the German guest worker system from the 1960s to the 1970s is an example of a policy very similar to Korea's employment uh, permit system. It was designed to bring in temporary workers and make sure they wouldn't bring their families and settle. And despite all the efforts of the German government, the long-term effect was the opposite. Germany became one of the most, uh, had, had the largest number of immigrants of any European country. It's a highly diverse society and it's got large ethnic minorities. So that is an example of the failure of a guest worker policy. What are the reasons for that? And again, Phil, Phil Martin has already told us some of this. Um, if you ask migrant workers at the time of migration whether they want to move permanently or temporarily, they'll say, temporarily, we'll stay only a few years. But as they get older, as they get married and have children, their plans change and they turn into settlers. A second issue is that migrants are recruited temporarily, but in fact they meet long-term structural needs of the economy so that the economy becomes structurally dependent on keeping migrant workers. The fourth issue is that they don't want to go home unless things improve dramatically in those countries of origin, and if not, they will be reluctant to return. And then another set of issues that applies really only in liberal democratic societies, migrants become integrated into welfare systems, the law courts protect their rights, their human rights, and their rights to live with their family, and civil society organizations support migrants. So for all these reasons, it's almost impossible for democratic countries to prevent these, uh, this settlement tendency. If we look at Korea, we can already see ch tendencies to change. For instance, when the employment permit system was set up, um, workers were only allowed to come in for three years and then they had to go away for another year before they could apply for a second contract. Now that period of waiting has been reduced already to one month, which means effectively people go on vacation for a month and they come back again. So effectively we're talking about six years already. Employers, and especially those in small and medium enterprises, want migrant workers to stay once they have become trained and good workers. And then we have some other interesting tendencies in, uh, in Korea that are not really economic migration. For instance, the return migration of ethnic Koreans from China and Russia under special schemes. And then for me, the most interesting and surprising development of the last five years is the enormous growth in marriage migration. I believe 
around 15% of marriages celebrated in Korea now involve a foreign partner, usually a foreign wife. Now clearly, having foreign wives makes an enormous cultural difference to countries because it is normally the, the mother of children who transfers language and culture. If the wife comes in from outside, that means there will be new cultural influences uh, from the earliest childhood. Um, now, we're running out of time, so I'm going to skip a lot of what I was going to say about Europe. Those who are interested can read about it in the paper. I'd, I'm just going to go to my, uh, my final considerations about what all this could mean for developments in Korea. So I mentioned earlier that there is um, a belief in Korea that there is a very strong homogenous identity and the question is can that be maintained in a situation of globalization? And my answer to that is that Korea is clearly already moving towards greater cultural diversity but it is at a very early stage in the process. Now, if you compare the numbers, the, the proportion of immigrants in the population in Korea with other countries, you can see this, this factor of being at an early stage. In Korea, only 1 to 2 percent of the population are foreign immigrants at the moment. That compares with the United States, where 12 percent of the population are foreign born. With Europe, most European countries have 5 to 10 percent immigrants. And the most extreme case, of course, is Australia, where 23 percent of the population are foreign born. So Korea is not at that stage yet of the development of multicultural society. It may never get to that stage. I think Korea is going to become more diverse, but it's going to be a slow process. And I think that gives Korean policymakers and the Korean public time to plan and to decide where they want things to go. <coughs> a second question in this context is whether it's desirable to maintain a homogenous identity. And I think that what is happening in Korea today with this very rapid economic growth and globalization is an opening to external influences which leads to a much more developed economy and society. Societies that try to cut themselves off completely are backward. And you can think of examples like Albania or China before about 1990. These were societies that tried to exclude external influences and therefore became very stagnant and technologically backward. Successful societies are open societies. So homogeneity should perhaps not be the key objective. So what does this mean for policies in Korea? Um, the employment permit system is an attempt at a temporary or cir circular migration policy and we've heard about the, the problems of such policies. I think they can be made to work if they're based on incentives and not compulsion. If you try and expel people after three years work in a country, they will simply go underground and become illegal workers, which will be much worse in every way. It's better to give them good reasons why they should return home. Assist with savings, assist with training, give return assistance, integration assistance, so that people can return to their home societies and set up su successful businesses or find jobs. So there has to be a partnership between the immigration country and the country of origin if circular migration is to work. It can't be a one-sided policy in the interest of the receiving country. Secondly, migrant workers should have equal rights. If you have workers who get inferior pay and conditions, this is actually harmful to your economy because it means that non-productive sectors will survive instead of outsourcing. Um, it's much better that for economic reasons that workers should be equal, but of course there is also a strong human rights argument for that. Thirdly, however good your circular migration policy, some migrants will always stay. There will always be a certain proportion who form 
uh, personal c connections, perhaps get married, have children and want to stay. Uh, a, a good migration policy must provide a way of legally changing from temporary to permanent status, as for instance the United States does. And that means that in the long run, some of those immigrants who have settled will also want to become citizens. Public policy should combat discrimination and ensure that migrants can participate fully in society. And I'm very encouraged to see that the Korean Ministry of Justice has already taken measures to, to work in this direction and to achieve integration. Fifthly, there is a need to change public attitudes. And of course, that is not something that can be done from the top down, but there is a need for political leadership to help people think about uh, long-term objectives. Does that mean that a country like Korea has to give up its national identity? I don't believe so. I think that successful multicultural societies like the United States, Britain, Canada, India even, have strong national identity. But a modern liberal society can allow many different cultural choices and can indeed protect the right to make cultural choices. I think it's possible to link traditional identities with new influences. Um, some people argue that there is a, a conflict between multiculturalism and social cohesion. In other words, that multicultural societies tend to have a lot of conflict. I think you can find examples around the world of multicultural societies where diversity has not led to conflict and where indeed there is a great deal of political stability. Canada is a very good example for that. So finally, I think this is the decision that faces you in Korea. It's not about whether you want to become multicultural. It's what type of multicultural society. Do you want one in which there are discriminated minorities or do you want an inclusive society in which everyone can participate fully? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Stephen Cashin. Uh, I was reading, as you have been, uh, what, uh, what kind of alternatives he could propose to us. I think he first asked the possibility of, uh, of uh, um, uh, Korean uh, society to introduce this uh, 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 homogeneous society problem. And uh, is it possible to, to change from our homogeneous society to, uh, to multicultural society? And uh, another one is uh, desirability of, of that. And both answers, I think he proposed not, uh, not much of uh, you know, uh, possibility. So we have to accept that uh, reality. Now, Polish proposals, he, he, he showed uh, several uh, 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 Polish choices, but among many others, like incentives, uh, permanent status uh, uh, givings, and uh, discrimination, uh, deducting discriminations, I think the most important thing is public attitude. He pointed out the public attitude of this uh, you know, migration, labor migration, or marriage migration, is the key and critical factor of uh, Korean uh, Polish uh, uh, measures. Now, uh, since we have uh, uh, heard the three uh, presenters <coughs> of, uh, of their uh, expertise, and now we'll come back to Korean uh, perspective. Uh, he, she was uh, Professor Park at uh, from uh, Myeonggi University, is supposed to uh, discuss those three papers, but I think he will present short summary of his own ideas with, the, with the, some critics. Would you please welcome Professor Bakwa Sir from the New University. Um, it is my great honor to be a uh, discussant to this world prominent scholars, uh, especially Professor Castle has been my guru in immigration studies, so it is really extreme honor for me personally. Um, 
Um, for the last couple of years, multiculturalism has been one of the most widely and frequently debated issues in Korea. As Professor Castle said, Korea's careful immigration management to avoid permanent settlement of foreign workers did not turn out as, it, as they planned. Um, Korea has reorganized that strictly rotational foreign workers management system no longer serves the reality. It has decided to evolve along the seemingly inevitable metamorphosis by legislating various laws and re restructuring government agencies. It has also studied experiences of other countries extensively and benchmarked their policies to skip their errors. For example, it moved from temporary foreign labor program to full immigration management, including permanent settlement of foreigners leading to the Korean citizenship. The basic law for foreign residents came into force in 2006 and has provided the legal basis to implement immigrant settlement programs by local governments. And the Korean government's immigrant settlement program are encouraging two-way learning between native Koreans and immigrants rather than unilaterally assimilation oriented. All the new policies and regulations reflect Korean government's commitment in ensuring the equal opportunities of immigrants and their children. The Korean Immigration Services has been, Service has been expanded. The Bureau for the Immigrants Social Integration has been added to the existing Immigration Bureau. The description of the Korean national identity as the most homogeneous country literally translated into a mono-ethnicity nation in school textbooks has been scraped and the multicultural education has been strongly emphasized in, at all local schools. One of the themes for the first World Korean Day held the, on October the 5th was overcoming our fixation on Korean pure blood as the basis for the transnational ethnic Korean bond. The above mentioned among others would demonstrate that Korea has recognized its ethnic diversity and conscien conscientiously decided to become an inclusive multicultural nation uh, at least as it is reflected in the related laws and policies and, and the rhetoric by the government and media. We are following experts' advices uh, very loyally. However, there are other signs from the business community, governments confusing integration programs and national agenda that could easily send conflicting messages. Firstly, one of the, the examples is that the, some employers are complaining that foreign workers are paid a lot more than their less competitive performance. The validity of industrial trainee program which is replaced by the uh, employment permit scheme is still very much supported in the business sector. And the second, second example is people's fatigue with overtoned rhetoric about workers' rights by the left-wing government and associated groups shows vividly these days. It is generally expected that in the next government, economic growth more than welfare rights will be pursued more rigorously. And thirdly, the government settlement assistance for the foreign brides is focused on supporting their successful role as wives, daughters-in-law, mothers of Korean children, and as the residents of agricultural villages. That means that their status as relations to Koreans is more important than their status as uh, independent immigrants. Not much consideration has been given to runaway brides, for instance. What would happen when foreign brides sponsor their relatives from their home country and form their own ethnic enclaves in Korea is beyond our government's immediate plan and beyond public's imagination. And fourthly, as a result of recent visit to North Korea by our present No, we are expecting a lot more economic cooperation between two Koreas, combining South Korea's capital and technology and labor 
of North Korea establishing more industrial zones like Kaesong. Then aging foreign workers permanently settled in, in the country would look less needed. Fifthly, the, the reunification of the land is emotional issue with the highest priority for Koreans. The fourth undercurrent, the pursuit of the reunification of Korean Peninsula is mostly the ethnic homogeneity among Koreans. This agenda is expected to continue as a top national priority, balancing multiculturalism in local community and reconfirmation of ethnic homogeneity across two cultures two Koreas would certainly not be very simple. And there are 7 million ethnic Koreans living overseas. Both South and North Korean governments have authorities dealing with the transnational ethnic Korean network called the Hanminjok network. Korean immigration law gives special status comparable to Korean citizens to overseas ethnic Koreans. Han Minjok network gets increasingly influential over Korean domestic affairs, including as important issue as the peace process between two Koreas. The overseas ethnic Koreans transcend the division of Korean Peninsula through establishing factories outside Korea, such as in, in China, with capital from South Korea and employing North Korean workers. While South Korea is becoming multicultural, the global ethnic solidarity among Korean diaspora seems increasingly strengthened, having centrifugal point in Korean Peninsula. Now, despite challenging aspects of building a multicultural society, there are overriding needs to import more foreigners such as healthcare workers that Dr. Abela informed us about. But to open up the closely guarded membership of Korean medical profession, Korea has to take all sorts of prior, prior steps to form appropriate media, including reciprocal recognition of professional accreditation between countries in concern. Also, it will be a new frontier for Korean public to adapt themselves to. To get along with foreign origin workers at the factory is one thing, but to become vulnerable at the mercy of foreign health workers with whom full communication is not possible would be another for Koreans. Unlike Europe, that has a relatively long history of, um, of immigration and colonial experience, for majority of Korean Koreans, more familiarity with foreigners and foreign cultures might be prerequisite to feeling relaxed about foreign medical professionals. But then, as Professor Castles mentioned, the implication of Korea's emigration history, having sent Korean nurses to Germany in the 60s, Koreans might not feel very nervous being put at the opposite end of the business. Well, okay, my question is, in summary, are, would the globalization foreign workers and immigrants transform the homogeneous Korean society into something more than a territory that contains the aggregate of diverse ethnic groups, actually? Who are the people among Dutch citizens, for example, that discarded their long years of most liberal and open form of multiculturalism and refocused on core values of Netherlands? Why didn't long coexistence among ethnic groups change the core values or core groups? It's, according to Professor Castles, it seems that all the different approaches to in incorporation of immigrants have some problems. Is integration going to be just an ideology or is it possible future for age-old ho homogeneous country like Korea? Korean government has adopted overseas legal and administrative frame proven to be most effective for the multiculturalism in anticipation of future changes. Would it be effective for its integration process as it is believe believed? Or would it be wiser to manage the unique animal of Korean society as it moves on? 
Would Korea be able to make its choice toward an inclusive and sustainable society as Professor Kassel encouraged us? Or, que sera, sera, in the age of migration dictated by the global dynamics? Would the dichotomy of nation-state regime and the transnational regime of the world contribute to the integration of diverse ethnic groups as well as retaining national cohesion? or to the fragmentation and the conflicts. Professor Castle is saying Korea no longer has to decide whether it wants to become a multicultural society. As a matter of fact, we made that decision long years ago. Dr. Abella is saying that even a homogeneous country like Korea needs to recruit foreign workers to survive. Transnational labor management is an integral part of our wholesome system. Professor Martin is saying migration is a process to be managed, not a problem to be solved. I would like to tell you a quote from Zen Buddhism that my, my son told me. You can make the future as long as you have to leave the past. But how would we able to leave the homogeneous past is my question. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. But you still have time to write. Go ahead. Right. Yes, go ahead. Would you please identify yourself? And also, to whom you are asking, would you please okay. express uh, Let me speak in Korean. I'm the Moderator of the Moderator of the 인구 문제나 이런 것들 때문에 오늘 말씀하신 부분 굉장히 주의 있게 잘 들었습니다. 제 질문은 uh, Professor Kassel, uh, uh, Kassel 교수님께 uh, uh, 질문 드리고 싶은데 지금 uh, 한국의 진단한 문제가 지금 uh, 외국 uh, 이민 부분에 대해서 말씀하신 걸잘 경청을 했고 곧 남북 문제가 uh, 북한에 있는 사람들이 많이 남한으로 좀 오게 되고 또그 서로 저희가 원투를 원하지 않던 새로운 워, 워커를 받아들여야 될 텐데 그런 데 대한 준비를 어떻게 했으면 좋겠는지 영국의 다른 그 경험 같은 게 있으시면 좀 들었으면 좋겠습니다. 오케이, okay. uh, Professor Kesson, you here, you get that. 오케이, 오케이. Yes, another question. Yes, go ahead, sir. Right. Yes, here. Yes. Yeah. 오케이. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Tariq, and I'm from Pakistan Ministry of Education. And I have an experience of working in Southeast Asia as a faculty consultant in the Colombo Plant region. My, uh, I have heard the three sp uh, speakers and very learned speakers. My question is, first of all, we talk about the aging society. But I think there is a difference between the aging society in the developed countries and the developing countries. I think the needs of the aging society for the developing countries is different from the developed countries. Do you agree to this point? Number two question is <clears throat> that we talk about globalization and multiculture. At the same time, I think the policies of various countries is becoming a little bit strict in migration and bringing the labor force. So do you think, uh, I think the uh, Professor Stephen Castle has given a very middle path, okay we have to provide incentives, we have to at the same time some compulsions. But my point is that we talk about globalization but at the same time we strict our boundaries as well. Do you think that we will have some kind of middle path at the same time with this kind of changes going on throughout the world? Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you very much. much. Yes, uh, yes, there is one uh, lady. Okay, go ahead. Hello, my name is Kwak from Korea. I would like to ask Professor Billy Martin. I remember you mentioned that one of, some of the employers in America, they won't be willing to keep migrant employers, employees for a long time and they would like to send them back to their countries. In, this, in that sense, I would like to mention that there are some Asian cabin crews who are working for major 
European countries such as KLM, Royal Dutch Airlines, and Air France. And when I mean that Asian cabin crews, that means that they are based in Korea, but have to make a flight to Europe maybe three times a month. But they are not allowed to work forever for those airlines, so they only allow them to work for maybe four years and five years, and they have to find another job. So I just wonder how you could explain this situation, why this thing is happening. Maybe some people might interpret this as a discrimination against the age of the woman, or has it something to do with the movement of Poland, Netherlands, like returning to homogeneous countries? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am sorry there are several more uh, individuals who want to ask questions, but as I said, unfortunately we do not have enough time. And we have to, uh, right, at this, uh, right after this session, we have to make the room for another team to come to this room. So what we call the P P4 principle, first in, first out. So we have to uh, I have to uh, limit the questions here. So, uh, just Firstly, <coughs> sorry, I'd like to thank Professor Park for her excellent uh, summary and comments. And she, she raised a number of issues which we probably don't have time to go into. I, I skipped the part of the, part of the paper where I talked about the different integration problems in Europe. And what I said in that part of the paper was really that all the European countries are trying out different models to integrate immigrant populations and all of them have some difficulties and at the moment there is a lot of debate in Europe about the best approach and I think the main problem in Europe has been that none of the different integration models have found ways of dealing with economic inequality and ensuring that migrants and their children above all have equal opportunities and maybe that's what Korea it does need to look at in the European experience and see that a lot of mistakes have been made and maybe they could be avoided. Um, the gentleman <coughs> near the back um, who asked about the, the issue of um, parallels with uh, the relationship between South and North Korea, well the obvious parallel of course is, is Germany. And Germany has this interesting situation where it's actually had about 20 million migrants since the Second World War, but a lot of them were ethnic Germans who came from Russia and Romania and so on. And then in uh, 1990 with reunification, of course, West Germany, which had a very successful economy, had the problem of incorporating <coughs> 17 million people who had been in, in a quite backward uh, economy perhaps not as backward as the North Korean one, but certainly not comparable with West Germany. One of the interesting lessons of that was that many people thought that the, the foreign migrants, like the Turks, would lose their jobs and the employers would take on the, the German workers from East Germany. And in fact, that didn't happen at all, because the, the West German employers said, these Turkish workers are experienced workers, they're very good workers. We know that labor discipline in East Germany is extremely bad uh, because the economy was very weak. And they were completely unwilling to replace foreign workers with German workers from the East. So the situation in Germany, this is now 17 years since reunification, is that there is still not an effective economic integration between the, uh, the, the West and the East and that uh, many parts of the East are still quite depressed economically. But it hasn't had much impact on migration to the West. It's, it's largely seen as a different problem. Um, was there another question to me? Oh yes, the, um, the issue of a middle path in migration policy. I, I, I agree very much with the, the sentiments behind that. I mean, uh, the, the work I do in my institute is really about migration from Africa to Europe. And I think one of the problems is that developed countries are very willing to exploit the human resources of poorer countries, especially skilled workers. And it's an enormous problem for Africa, and, and indeed for India and the Philippines, that they're losing many of their medical personnel, IT personnel, and other skilled workers to developed countries. And uh, as um, I think uh, Dr. Abela implied there must be some reciprocity 
there must be a way of making sure that there is a return flow of resources and talents to compensate for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Martin. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the discussant and the, the audience for the interesting questions. Let me just sort of make three points that go to most of these questions. The first is that I don't, just as there's no easy way to manage labor migration, there's also no easy way to manage integration. I mean, keep in mind that in a multi -country, multicultural country like the United States, we stopped Chinese immigration in California. And in fact, we had laws that said Chinese had to be out of town, out of the cities, by 6 o'clock at night. I mean, that happened really only 100 years ago, where there was explicit discrimination against people from particular countries. We had the President of the United States writing letters in the 1930s saying all Italians are mafia, and if he had his way, he would kick them out of the United States. It didn't happen, but keep in mind the history of integration is not necessarily a pretty history at the time you're living it. it. Later on, you can look back and say, what were they worried about? Because it all turned out okay. But at the time, it's not necessarily uh, an easy history. So as Korea struggles with developing integration measures, it's probably important to remember that there's not a model on the shelf to copy. It'll be a unique Korean experience reflecting 21st century Korea, not 20 or 30 year, 20th century United States or Europe. Uh, the second thing is that the one, Korea is unique in many respects, but the North Korean example is important. The big issue that you'll face uh, is, and remember in Germany, is if you bring the wages in North Korea up quickly to hold people at home, it will not be attractive for investment. If you let the wages stay down, young people will leave. And there's not an easy choice. And so that's been one of the real dilemmas in Germany. They did bring the wages up, which meant the investments there had to be heavily subsidized. And many young people nonetheless left. And once again, there's maybe lessons to be learned about how not to do things, although politically that seemed to be the only option. Uh, but it's not necessarily an easy one. Finally, in, in thinking about middle paths, I think we've learned in most policies in society to avoid zigzags, avoid first going one extreme and then another extreme. We still do it, and maybe we're prone to do it in migration, but to the extent we can think of migration as like a big super tanker in the ocean. And we, tr we can only change it one degree at once. We can't have someone coming in and saying, we're going to stop all migration and throw out all these people. We're going to open up. It's changing very gradually, because that's the process that people can live with. The globalization of the airline industry, just like with the shipping industry, is going to be one that emphasizes the importance of something uh, Stephen Castle said, which is, anti-discrimination. You know and I know that in many countries, I've seen ads in countries where they advertise not just for young women, but pretty young women. Uh, and that is in the newspaper recruitment ads. Uh, those are things that many countries, including United States and Western Europe, have said you can't do that to have an inclusive society. We, we, have, we have not spread that, as you know, around the world, and we do have a whole series of companies that operate globally and don't necessarily, the good part of the globalization is to promote diversity, to give people opportunities they otherwise wouldn't have, but it's also important to emphasize that some universal principles, like anti-discrimination, uh, protecting fundamental human rights are very important in all companies. And I think that's something we will be working on more and more in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Havila. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Migration uh, policy making is one that uh, easily lends itself to being used by politicians and political parties. And we have seen uh, in a number of countries where political parties may have gained uh, votes by uh, either creating a scare of foreigners and what have you. So we, we do have some risks in having uh, uh, some of these uh, societies which are not yet ready perhaps for, for, for the large inflows of foreign workers, that uh, political groups uh, might take advantage of uh, nascent fears and anxieties of society to take advantage. So it requires a lot of leadership from, from a policy, from leaders of the country, uh, statemanship, if you wish, uh, to, to draw, uh, to give the right directions. Uh, I, having observed Korea, uh, I'm not at all uh, pessimistic that the right directions will be drawn. I think your leaders have always responded and adjusted to global changes uh, in the best way possible. And I see no reason why this should be any different. Uh, and I'm always encouraged by what you see on the ground, that local communities, NGOs, parts of civil society, uh, are taking on a lot more of the functions that could be perhaps be felt be done by the state but are being done by civil society. In trying to deal with many of the day-to-day -day problems that arise when you have a larger and larger uh, foreign communities in your midst. And um, I, for example, we were, for example, in a meeting a week ago in Japan where a scholar from, from a Japanese university discussed how many local governments in Japan uh, have banded together uh, to, to come up with very, very concrete and specific programs to deal with various problems that afflict uh, their communities, whether it be training for migrant workers, dealing with their health insurance, uh, providing for referral to employers, uh, taking care of children's education, and, and what have you. Uh, many, sometimes you wonder whether national leaders are even slower than local leaders in responding to many of these challenges and are perhaps, perhaps we worry too much about whether society can adjust to this. Maybe societies have adjusted uh, much, much more quickly than, than the leaders here. Maybe uh, I understand in some countries that uh, uh, some of the people, some of the politicians who spout uh, anti-immigrant positions, if you scratch them, scratch them enough, you will be liberal uh, that they are more liberal than that. But uh, because they feel that their votes are, depend very much on, on, on this image and, and the probably a myth that uh, societies are worried about migrants. Uh, certainly, uh, the policies, uh, states must set the policies for treatment of migrant workers that are fair and based on international principles. We don't really, we, I'm sure we all agree that the worst thing that can happen is to create a subclass in your societies that will be stigmatized uh, and considered as dangerous because they are in ghettos. Uh, they are, because they're exploited, they're poor, uh, and sometimes they may resort to, to some extreme measures to, to protect their lives. Uh, and, and this stigmatization sometimes happens even with the best of intentions. I, I know, for example, in one European country, uh, in order to house refugees, the state appropriated a lot of money to use some public lands to create housing for refugees. But in no time at all, that became a slum. And the poor refugees who have lived there have been stigmatized into people who are uh, in a very dangerous ghetto and so on. Uh, so the, the, the scientists may be very, very careful uh, not to create a situation where you have marginalized groups in your society. And that's it's so important to have equal treatment uh, for okay. migrant workers. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Vela. Now, uh, we are already ran out of time, and uh, uh, I 
as a um, uh, chairman of this uh, session, I think I have to at least say a few words, but uh, not uh, much. Uh, with one sentence, uh, am I willing to be? Am I going to be willing to accept my future son-in-law or daughter-in-law from different ethnic origin? Well, that's the key question that we have to leave with this room, I guess. And uh, thank you for uh, uh, your cooperation. And I think uh, you are the best uh, audiences I've ever uh, met. And uh, our, our brilliant presenters, I thank you and discussant. Thank you very much. And I have to stop uh, our discussion here. Thank you very much.